Still there, I'm Barbara Serra, and you're at The Listening Post. Coming up this week, Egypt erupts again. It's the revolutionaries versus Mohamed Morsi. The sting operation making news in India. This time, it's the journalists who got stung. Stories of sex abuse, bad editorial decisions, and heads rolling. How has the BBC weathered its recent crisis? And... A public service message with a sense of humor. It's being called phase two of the Egyptian revolution. Thousands of demonstrators are on the streets across Egypt, and they're protesting against the man who was elected into power just five months ago, President Mohamed Morsi. Morsi's move to grant himself sweeping powers and push for a hastily drafted new constitution were seen as tactics pulled straight out of former President Hosni Mubarak's playbook. His media strategy echoes Mubarak's as well, with state TV again being commandeered to broadcast the message from the president. Palace. However, there are some big differences. Private media in Egypt have sharpened their teeth and have been unafraid to bear them at Morsi. And then there is the coverage on the outlet that was seen as one of the channels of the revolution, the Egyptian arm of the Al Jazeera network, Al Jazeera Mubashir Masser. Once celebrated by the crowds at Tahrir, Mubashir Masser has come under fire from Morsi's opposition for their coverage of the president and the protests. The Listening Post's Minna Akshi Ravi reports now on the battle between Morsi and revolutionary Egypt, a battle that's being played out on the streets and over the airwaves. There's really a lot of turmoil in the Egyptian media landscape, a growing identity crisis for the media and perhaps even for the country at large. This is a very divided country and this is very much reflected in the media. With this political polarization in the Egyptian society, the media is a key player in this polarization. Of all the miscalculations Mohamed Morsi made, his biggest one was to underestimate the power of the revolutionary forces in Egypt. With demonstrations exploding in every corner of the country, containing the protesters and managing the message have been top priorities. The state, represented by Mohamed Morsi and the ruling Muslim Brotherhood, have more media instruments at their disposal than uh, almost all of their, uh, their opposition. The state media uh, in Egypt is an absolutely colossal institution and has remarkable reach to every part of the Egyptian state. To a large extent, the Muslim Brotherhood has its own instruments at its disposal. It's got its own newspaper, the Freedom and Justice newspaper, and the Muslim Brotherhood's television network, Masr 25. Masr 25 remind me to a great extent of the way the Libyan uh, TV channels used to cover uh, the Libyan revolution under Gaddafi. I mean, it was very strange and stunning, for example, to see the protests last week outside the Tahadeya or the presidential palace. And then you see that Masr 25 is not saying a thing about that, but actually playing a recorded report about a prominent Salafist sheikh visiting Matruh, for example, and the, and the people of Matruh announcing their solidarity with the president. On the other hand, when it's a Muslim Brotherhood rally or a rally pro the president, they would actually give it all the coverage that it needs and even more. Over the last two years, Egypt's state broadcaster has had to switch allegiances between three different masters. It's not clear if President Morsi has learned any media lessons from the revolution that overthrew Mubarak, but the journalists working within the state broadcasting center, Maspiro, seem to have done. Under Mubarak, state television was a very important tool of the regime, but we find that changing because state TV lost its credibility during the uprising and uh, it's now trying to appear more balanced and to try and win back the viewers that it lost. One of the prominent uh, television presenters in, in, on state television came out and uh, went on a, a short diatribe, if you will, explaining that the country is being stolen by the Muslim Brotherhood and by the Islamists and brought into the studio what looks like a shroud, uh, basically saying this is the shroud uh, that one would wrap their body in. We're taking our opinions to the grave, and we have to remember those who lost their lives in this revolution. We cannot reinstate a dictatorship. For them to go out on air and risk their credibility with the audience and to make this political position, it sends a message that actually that the media people inside Maspiro is still being put 
under great pressure. And the cracks have begun to show. On November 4th, the Egyptian Journalist Syndicate announced they were joining with the protesters at Tahrir. Employees at the state-run Ahram Online website were there as well. And two days later, Esam al -Amir, head of state broadcasting, resigned. Given the current circumstance in Egypt, many in the media perceive the status quo and the direction that the country is going in as a significant threat to their own right to do free media. And in essence, uh, this is almost like their last stand. It is effectively the last stand for the fourth estate. The activists demonstrating against Morsi are fierce guardians of their revolution. They're hyper aware of the power of the media and they're vocal when they don't like the coverage they see. One target of this anger has been the Egyptian channel started by Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera Mubashir Misr. On November 21st, anti-Morsi protesters torched the channel's offices, angry at the amount of airtime given to the Muslim Brotherhood. Many people in Egypt look very critically at Al Jazeera Mubashir Misr. The criticism can be a little bit harsh, but Al Jazeera Mubashir Misr is producing very some very professional programs, but the platform it's giving for the Muslim Brotherhood and the platform it's giving for the criticism of, of the opposition in general has been very annoying. Most of the guests that they invite on air who are critical of Mohamed Morsi are treated to a fairly rigorous attack and, and sometimes vilification. Uh, I mean, we understand that you know it's all about the opinion and, and the other opinion, but in some cases it appears as though there's only one opinion on uh, Al Jazeera, Mubesh and Musk. We put these criticisms to the channel's managing director, Mr. Ayman Gabala. We receive criticism from all the parties, from Muslim Brotherhoods, from uh, liberals, from uh, from leftists, from all the the parties, and we measure this as a measure for our success. We have criticism from all the opinions. That means we are not a pro to anyone or we are not anti to a certain party. Uh, simple statistics can uh, tell you that we host um, roughly between 10 to 15 guests a day. Most of them are really balanced. We rarely have uh, one, one guest. Usually we have uh, two guests uh, per, per program. If we, we can't manage to have the two sides in the same platform, we have the, uh, the first opinion and the, we follow it in, in another program with the other opinion uh, directly. For example, after the demonstration in front of the palace, we had two guests. They refused actually to sit down together. So we give the first one one hour and the next one we give him the same time exactly. And this is uh, normal and this is our day-to-day -day business actually. In a divided Egypt, the day-to-day -day business of the media is complicated and messy. But the news doesn't stop breaking, stories keep developing, and the cameras keep rolling. Our Global Village voices now on the politics of reporting the Egyptian story. What we have right now is a very changed media landscape. While independent outlets may now feel that they can afford to make risky decisions, such as refusing to publish, it remains to be seen what the effects of that will be, if it will be amount to a self-censorship that will be a disadvantage, or if it will prove that the populace at large now wants and expects an independent media, and what role that will play in the coming decisions to be made by Mursi. Morsi has used the state media in a very similar way to the old regime um, to advance his own political agenda. We can see that with um, the state media giant Ahram, uh, where the coverage of the recent protests has been um, pretty much biased. The same goes for the state TV, um, where TV shows um, have been uh, have um, experienced blackout if they have criticised the president. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. The Associated Press has bombed on a story, a story they called an exclusive, a story they said showed evidence that Iran was developing a nuclear weapon, a story that is at best incorrect and at worst a hoax. The article by the Wire Agency was based on a graph that, according to reporter George Jean's sources, measures the destructive power of a potential Iranian nuclear weapon. The problem is the graph doesn't hold up to scientific scrutiny and the journalism doesn't hold up to journalistic scrutiny either. The diagram was leaked by unnamed officials from, quote, a country critical of Iran's atomic program. 
This is the third of a series of incorrect reports by Jean. Both his previous stories relied on information from unnamed sources and expert comment from two former officials at the International Atomic Energy Agency, both of whom have been called out before for hyping tenuous claims about nuclear activity in Iran and Iraq. And there's a final twist in this story. The exclusive report wasn't really exclusive. The graph was featured last year in the IAEA's November report, and the agency had made it clear that none of the information was verified. India's news media may be a growth industry, but it's not a profit-making one. The country has hundreds of private outlets all battling each other for more corporate ad dollars. And now a surprising sting operation has revealed just how seamy the business side of news can be. This was a reverse sting. The men you see in this video are journalists Sudhir Chowdhury and Samir Aluwalia, editors at the Hindi language channel Z News. Both men were arrested on November 27th for attempting to extort $18 million from one of India's biggest steel production companies, Jindal Steel. The video was secretly filmed by executives of the company. It shows Z News's editors promising to drop a story about Jindal Steel's involvement in a national coal mining scandal if the company would run ads on their air for the next five years. Z News's editors say that the video has been selectively edited and that in fact they were conducting a sting on Jindal Steel. However, they haven't released any of their footage. This is a case where the media community isn't rallying in support of their colleagues. Sevanti Nainam, editor of the Indian media watch group The Hoot, wrote, some narratives of free speech violation the media buys into, others it's considerably more skeptical about. Z News falls into the latter category. The US TV series The Simpsons airs in over a hundred countries, but in Turkey, the broadcasting authorities are not laughing. CNBCE, that's the channel that broadcasts The Simpsons, has been hit with a fine of $30,000 for airing an episode that showed the devil ordering God to make him a coffee. Turkey's broadcasting regulator, RTUK, said the show insulted religious sentiments. The government in Ankara has gained a reputation for being harsh on the media. There are currently 95 journalists behind bars. That's up from 57 last year. Last week, Prime Minister Tayyip Erdogan criticized the makers of a hit TV soap opera called Magnificent Century over what he said were historical inaccuracies in their depiction of the Ottoman Emperor Suleiman's life. However, Erdogan's critics say he's less concerned with historic accuracy as he is with pushing conservative Islamic values in the country. It's the biggest and most recognized news network in the world. For decades, the publicly funded British Broadcasting Corporation has been a journalistic standard bearer, which is why its recent crisis was such big news. A decision by the BBC's flagship current affairs show, Newsnight, to drop a story about alleged sexual abuse by Jimmy Savile, who was one of the network's most celebrated broadcasters, ripped through the corporation and eventually led to the resignation of its director general, George Entwistle. If you wanted to write a manual about how not to deal with a crisis, then the BBC's Savile scandal is where you might begin. Editors stepped aside, false accusations of pedophilia were aired, and the repercussions have been felt across the Atlantic, where the BBC's former director general, Mark Thompson, who was at the helm when the Savile story was dropped, is now CEO of the New York Times newspaper. The listening posts flow Phillips now on the unraveling crisis at the BBC and the bad press it's given itself. British media's coverage of the scandals at the BBC has verged on the hysterical at times. Their response has been vitriolic towards the BBC. The opportunity to have a go at the BBC has been one that they have seized with great alacrity. Any reason they can find to be negative about the BBC, they will. The biggest television news organisation in the world. A British institution. 17,000 employees under the microscope because of one programme, Newsnight. And one former employee, a man named Jimmy Savile. Welcome to January the 1st, 
1964. The importance of Jimmy Savile is that he was a star that the BBC made. Having made uh, Jimmy Savile, the BBC's kind of responsible for what Jimmy Savile did. ITV uh, ran a documentary exposing uh, Savile as a paedophile, which is something the BBC should have done and could have done. It's obviously embarrassing for the BBC that they had the story, uh, they decided not to transmit it for certain reasons, but that a rival station found the time and the resources to actually investigate the story fully and found a story that was worth transmitting. But let's be fair to the BBC. Number one, Panorama, BBC's flagship current federal, did a damning film about Newsnight. How did one man harm the entire society? How many media organisations in the world allows one of its programmes to attack another of its programmes? I think the BBC accepts that it made a massive error, the Newsnight programme made a massive error, and it's now bending over backwards to interrogate itself. But not always helping itself. When Newsnight tried to rectify the situation, it ended up broadcasting another film that made serious allegations about an alleged paedophile. It turned out to be a case of mistaken identity. A new crisis for Newsnight. Tonight, this programme apologises. Someone had to face the music. It was the Director General. On November 10th, George Entwistle went on the record to try to defend the organisation, but he just wasn't up to the job. After only 54 days in post, Mr Entwistle fell on his sword. Good morning, this is Today with John Humphreys. The interview between uh, George Entwistle, then the Director General, and John Humphreys on the Today programme was the most painful interview I have ever heard. You didn't know that that actually happened? No, I'm afraid I didn't. He was incredibly honest, but in the process revealed that he didn't seem to know what was going on, and I think in the end that did for him. The first organisation to leap to hold itself to account has been the BBC. The worst crisis that I can remember in my nearly 50 years at the BBC. Entwistle's failure to get to grips with the details of the crisis were exposed not by a rival broadcaster or a rival newspaper, but by a BBC news programme. If the BBC was going to get any credit for self-scrutiny, it wasn't coming from rivals and the profit-driven press, who jumped on the story about an organisation that they say benefits unfairly from public funding. The Murdochs have been going after the BBC for years, arguing the state broadcaster is an unfair competitor for everyone else. The scale and scope of its current activities and future ambitions is chilling. Murdoch-owned papers are thrilled to see the BBC suffer and welcome the distraction the BBC is providing from News Corp's own in-house scandal. I don't think the comparison to Rupert Murdoch and the hacking scandal is quite fair against the BBC because actually this is a crisis spurred by a couple of incidents of, yes, poor news practice and bad decision making. The hacking scandal, on the other hand, is systemic of poor journalistic practice and behaviour. They're in two different camps, really. But at the end of the day, you've had the editor of Newsnight stand aside, you've had the head of news and deputy head of news stand aside, you've had the director general stand down within a few weeks of taking charge uh, of the BBC. Compare that with News International and News Corp, where Rebecca Brooks, the chief executive, clung on for dear life, uh, and you have Rupert Murdoch, a man who is still chief executive and chairman of News Corp. All we've had from Murdoch was one day in front of a select committee. This is the most humble day of my life. But he's still in his job. As is the new chief executive officer at the New York Times, for the moment at least. Mark Thompson was George Entwistle's predecessor, director general at the BBC at the time the Savile expose was shelved. He happened to start his new job in New York just as the scandal was breaking in London. According to Mr Thompson, he knew nothing about it. We are asked to believe that Mark Thompson himself did not know about these allegations while he was at the BBC. So this has become an issue for him as the chief executive of the New York Times. I revealed that he had asked lawyers to send a letter threatening to sue the Sunday Times magazine if they published allegations about underage sexual abuse at the BBC. How could he have authorised them to threaten the Sunday Times if he had not actually read the letter himself, in which case he did know about the allegations at the BBC. This has resulted in a story in New York magazine headlined why Mark Thompson didn't know what was in the letter from Mark Thompson. I think there will be a great sense of panic at the New York Times right now. Interestingly, the New York Times itself and its public editor has run some pretty harsh stuff about what Thompson has to do and what he has to say in order to regain credibility and trust on this. It would be ironic if 
the director general of the BBC who succeeded Thompson lost his job within 54 days and Thompson loses his job at the New York Times in fewer than 54 days. That would be two of the best known media brands in the world damaged by the same scandal. The BBC is primarily funded by a taxpayer's licence fee paid by every television viewer in the country. The Conservative government froze the BBC's funding two years ago. In real terms, that's a 16% cut. It was a risky thing for the government to do. A poll taken last year revealed that 59% of Britons see the BBC as the most trusted media organisation in the country. No other organisation got more than 10%. And so, for all of its troubles, for all of its critics, the BBC remains extraordinarily popular with ordinary Britons. That's something the government must bear in mind in 2016, when the BBC's charter is up for renewal and the organisation's future will be determined. The future going forward for the BBC has to be about forging a much clearer relationship with their public, understanding what the public wants them to do. And on the whole, that requires them developing a bit more grit. The BBC has been reminded in the last few weeks that whilst it does many things to entertain the British public, whilst it does many things to educate them, its primary responsibility is to inform. And that means that the jewel in its crown, its journalism, is also its Achilles heel. If the BBC is to be trusted, respected and admired, as it is by the British public and around the world, then it must at all times maintain rigorous scrutiny and the highest conceivable standards in its journalism, both at home and abroad. 2016 is a big year for the BBC and it will be covering its own story. More Global Village voices now on the troubles at the BBC. I think the saddest thing about the episode is it gives those who want to an excuse to kick the BBC while it's down. Its journalistic output is top quality and it's unique in the world in the way that it can hold those in power, including its own Director General, to account. I think what needs to happen now is the money is taken out of management and put back into the newsroom so the corporation can continue to make the kind of quality journalism for which it's famous all over the world. Whenever I go abroad, every single person I meet says, isn't the BBC fantastic? I wish we had something like this in this country. And if you ask those people, would you think people will be prepared to pay for it? And people sometimes go a bit quiet, but let's not get us wrong. It is a Rolls Royce broadcasting outfit. Uh, and therefore, I think a lot of the sniping is often just born out of them, quite honestly. Finally, it's a morbid, unexpected subject of study, but unusual deaths have been recorded as early as 620 BC. This year alone, there was a man who died in a cockroach eating competition, a pig farmer who fell victim to his own livestock, and a skydiver who forgot his parachute. But it wasn't any of these stories that inspired the creators of our viral video this week, which is called Dumb Ways to Die. It's a public service announcement put together by Melbourne's Metro train service and it warns people to be a little more cautious, especially around train tracks. The video has more than 30 million hits online and you never know, it may just have saved as many lives. We'll see you next time right here at The Listening Post. Set fire to your hair Poke a stick at a grizzly bear Eat medicine that's out of date Use your private parts as piranha bait Dumb ways to die So many dumb ways to die Get your toast out with a fork Do your own electrical work Teach yourself how to fly Eat a two-week-old unrefrigerated pie up like a moose during hunting season disturb a nest of wasps for no good reason stand on the edge of the train station platform drive around the boom gets at a level crossing run across the tracks between the platforms they may not rhyme but they're quite possibly So many dumb ways
Just to die.